Greetings, youth. Greetings. It is very good to be here with people of God. Did everyone receive one of these hands out? If you haven't received a handout, raise your hand. We have one over here. We got two, three, four right here. We got a whole row. And then who needs a pencil to write things down? Raise your hand. I'm a little bit on the echo over here if we can bring the sound down a little bit. So keep your uh, hands raised until they come up to you and give you a handout. So we're phasing off from a spiritual race to a spiritual proof. And if you look at those handouts, there's a big bubble that says proof. I am the evidence. I am the evidence. We have a few more on this side, Peter. Yeah, three, three more handouts over here. This challenge of spiritual proof will be the reflections of our faith in a fallen society. The definition of proof means the evidence or the argument establishing or helping to establish a fact or the truth of a statement. Who's ever been in a situation, raise your hand, if you've been in a situation where you're arguing with your friend, you're debating about something, you wanna prove your point, and then your friend is like, prove it. Who's been in a situation like that? And then you have to prove it by doing something, right? There's a lot of times as we grew up as kids, uh, we played the game follow the leader. And we get on our bikes and we start doing tricks and jumping off and the other person who's behind has to do the same thing and then the other one who's behind does the same thing and it follows through. And then one of the guys who's up leader, he always wanted to do something new all the time. And he says it, he says, guys, I bet you anything that I'm gonna be the top leader on this bicycle ride. And we're just eight, nine years old, and all of a sudden, all of us, at age eight and nine, we just said, hey, prove it. So we get on our bikes, and he goes down, and he goes off, and there's like a big trash can, and then there's like a, one of those lift gates where people, when they have uh, to toss away trash, they open up a big garage door, and they just toss all of it out. And so we all drive down that little path. We don't know what he's about to do. And he goes on a garbage, and he didn't know that the lid was in there was cracked and broken. So as he jumps on a lid and tries to jump off of it and keep riding his bike, he jumped on it, he lifted up his wheel and did it like a wheelie, he ended up in that trash can. You know, a lot of times when we want to prove something and we have no idea what we're proving, we just want to prove it just to look that we know something, we're going to fail. You see, the Bible gives us 100% evidence that there is a living God. Like, for example, I know that we just did an icebreaker, but I want everyone in this room, if you think you're a Christian, please stand up. Okay? I'm going to ask you several questions. If you disagree with these statements... Please remain standing. There is no such a thing as a living God. You guys need to pay attention. If you disagree with these statements, please remain standing. I'll give you guys some grace. No, I said remain standing. If you disagree with these statements, please remain standing. There is no such a thing as a living God. Bible is a fairy tale. Okay, if God was real, then God used the Big Bang Theory to start the world. Okay? If you agree with these statements, if you agree with these statements, please remain standing. I believe in one true God, and that one God is in three persons. I believe God created the world in six literal days. I believe that Jesus died for everyone. I believe that the gospel is the best news that we have today. These next questions will reflect what you've done this past week. Please remain standing. Let's be honest. 
Please remain standing if you read the Bible this past week at least once. Please remain standing if you read the Bible this past week two to three times. Please remain standing if you are baptized. And if you're not baptized, please sit down. Please remain standing if you try to pray every day. Now, please remain standing if this past week you share the gospel with someone at least once. Thank you for being honest. You know, a lot of times in our life, you may be seated, oh, the rest of you. A lot of times in our life, we look around and we get used to so much of what the church does. And we get used to, to so much what we should be doing in the church. But it's so difficult to do something outside this building. Statistics say that only 5% of born-again Christians share their faith. 5%. I want to give you some scary statistics that the world that we live in. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, there's approximately 95,000 people that die from alcohol every year in the United States. There's over 100,000 drug overdoses deaths in the United States. There's 1.6 million suicides that were attempted in 2022 in the USA. And there's over 50,000 people that died from suicide in 2022. Do we all agree that we live in a broken society? Do we all agree that we live in a world where people are broken and people are looking for news that can just lift them up and get them just a little bit closer to having enough joy. That's the world that we live in today. I want us to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. This is where our text will be. This is the main verse for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For you are manifested and declared to be the letter of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Look what verse 2 says. You are the letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Can I remind you of one truth today? And that truth is this. That the challenge for you today is to know that your spiritual proof, what it is, where does it, does it exist in your life, and how can you prove that spiritual proof to this world? How can you prove to this world that you belong to a living God? Some of these questions that come towards us, we always wonder do I do enough? My schedule is filled. I have orchestra on Monday and Tuesday. I have choir on Thursday. I join Bible study on Saturday. I do all these things. But when was the time, the last time, you, individual, stood before this world as a living letter of Christ? Or are people doubting that there's a God when they see your life? Today, I want to challenge you on four models. You guys got these handouts, and the four models, if you can write them down, we have here the model of godly living. The model of godly living. The second model for your spiritual proof is the model of good works. And then the second blank is being zealous of good works. So that's the model of good works and being zealous of good works. The third one is the model of sound doctrine. The model of sound doctrine. And the last one is the model of gospel witnessing. Today we're gonna go over the first two, and then next week we're gonna go over 
the last two. So we just opened up this text that Apostle Paul writes to Corinthians. And if you think that you failed as a Christian, everyone failed as a Christian. Corinthian church was the most carnal, worldly church that existed. They allowed sins into their church and they justified it. And Apostle Paul knew the condition and he says to them, I come to you. I want to deliver spiritual milk, but then I want to deliver meat so you can grow. But you are carnal. You are carnally minded. They had sins, wicked sins that were not even announced with the people in the world. There is a son that was living in sin with his mother-in-law. And these sins were rising up in the church. He writes the second epistle and he says, you are the letter of Christ that people will read. So if you think you failed, there's a lot of people that failed God. But God God didn't give up on them. David, Samson, what about prophet Jonah? When God literally said, go preach a revival and people will repent and people will hear of me and they will come. What a great thing to do, to see people getting saved. Prophet Jonah turned away from that. But God hasn't given up. If you failed on God, God is bigger than that problem. He hasn't given up on you. And I want to encourage you to pay attention to these two topics about having a godly life and being zealous to good works. When you open up your handout to page number two, you'll see that the model of godly living, it gives us a question. And the question starts here, are you transformed? Are you transformed? If we open up our Bibles to Titus chapter two, Titus chapter two, we're gonna read from verse 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation have appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The question here rises up. Have you met God, the God of grace? Have you been transformed? That, that blank right there that you guys have, godly living is guided by sanctification. Godly living is guided by sanctification. If we open up Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 19, reads these words, I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness, and into iniquity, and onto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, onto holiness. Definition that I wrote for myself for sanctification, you have a blank there, it means two, four words, to be set apart. Sanctification means to be set apart. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, reads these words, Great words that are written by the apostle. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, says these words, by which we were all sanctified, we were all set apart, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So think of this. In the beginning, God created the universe. The universe was perfect. The perfect unity was united with God. Adam walked with God. And God created everything perfect in its time. But then man had a free will. 
And they stepped with that free will to go against God. And now ungodliness, wickedness, and iniquity has entered into the earth. And God sees how man failed. But God hasn't given up. He says, I'm going to give them a chance. He says, the seed of the woman is going to rise up. And we know who that seed is. In Genesis 3.15, we see the gospel there, that Jesus Christ will be the seed. And Jesus Christ came to change, to redeem him a peculiar people. He wanted the Israelites to be those peculiar people, to follow with him. He gave them tablets of stones so that they can follow and follow after God because it was the living God that they had to proclaim to the world. Now God turned his position from the people of Israel to his church. And he says, I no longer need the tablets of stone. I need your hearts. And I need those hearts and I need to write a story And that story began when you accepted Christ as your savior and God is doing something. He's writing a letter to this world. He says, I have James, I have David, I have Paul, I have Rebecca, I have Rachel here. They died to sin. They're living for me. They're gonna deny ungodliness. They're gonna deny worldly lusts and they're gonna follow me. And when you do these things, you proclaim to the world, not by only speaking the good news, but by your actions, your character, your manners, and everything else. You show who your God is. It's not that you were raised in a Christian family. I see some people that are raised in a Christian family. They're so lost in the world, and it's really sad. And we know some of those people. Some of us have relatives. Some of us have friends that we know they're lost. We have people in this church that grew up in our teens and our Sunday schools and they're out in the world addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, addicted to pornography, and they're just lost in this world facing all the worldly lusts. The next point is living a life of ungodliness means you live denying God's presence in your life. When you live a life of ungodliness, you live as if God doesn't exist. You just say that you're a Christian. You come to church on Sunday once, and that's enough. That's your Christianity. But Monday through Saturday, you live as if you're an atheist because your actions show it. Let's think about that. Let's think about what is our manner of life. All believers are called to three things when it comes to the aspect of holiness. There are three areas of your life that you need to show holiness in. The first point is the mind. And the mind is very, very important. And this is why we always say, be careful what you watch. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful. Because those things, when they come into your ears, they do something in your mind. They influence your mind. I know a lot of folks today, a lot of people that are just so addicted to social media. It's crazy. I talked to some of the teens in art. They're having a hard time falling asleep by 5 a.m. And I said, do you have a disease? Do you have something going on like, like blood pressure or what's going on? He says, no, it's, it's my phone. I'm on TikTok. I'm watching all these reels, all these shorts. I'm like, fix that problem. He says, how do I fix it? I'm like, take a hammer and smash the thing out. Throw it out. Your health, your life is worth more than that screen time. I just talked to a teenager and I said, hey, I woke up for work. I saw you on Snapchat. Man, you must have been waking up at 6 a.m. to go to work. He's like, no, actually, I was going to sleep. I was like, what is your screen time out? When you go on your screen, what is your screen time for Snapchat? He said six hours a day. Six hours a day. Guys, you know, we think we can face against this culture. We think we're so strong that we could, we could do it. But if you're not busy in the word of God, if not filling your mind with the word of God, your mind will be corrupted. It will be corrupted. You can dress up nice in the suit. You'll at least think about that. Hey, I'm going to church. I'm going to dress up nice. I'm not going to have ripped up jeans and shorts and stuff. I know I need to 
at least respect some people here. But in your mind, you're corrupted. And so he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, these manners of life. Let me go to that. 1 Peter 1, 15. I love this verse. It says, but as he which called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. That word conversation means all manner of your walk in life. It's not just conversation like you have a talk. It's everything. That Greek word means your way of life, the way you wake up and when you go to sleep. That moment of life, you have to show holiness. And you have to show it in your mind, in your body, because your body is the temple of God, and in your spirit. Now let me explain this. In your spirit. You would think, oh, if we have the spirit of God, everything's going to be good. Yes. But did you know that Saul had the spirit of God, King Saul? And then later we see the story that the evil spirit has come upon Saul. That Saul did something in his life. God had rejected him as king. He has rejected him as a man. And Saul took away his own life with suicide. That's why it's important. When you think about it, why isn't it important that we be careful what we listen to and what we watch? Because something happens between the mind and the spirit. They work together. And if we're going to send a conflict to our mind, it's going to send a conflict to our spirit. We can quench the spirit. We can reject the spirit. The spirit gives us chances when we sit and we listen to the word of God and there's something that's really, you know, convicting us. God uses the word of God. He uses the preacher and he uses his spirit. Remember those times. A lot of you were still standing when I said, please sit down if you have not got baptized. Majority of you are here are baptized. Think about it. Think about that moment when you stepped into coming to God Repenting, that joy, feeling clean, feeling revived, feeling like you want to just conquer the world with the gospel. And that's what the cleansing does. Look what Titus chapter 2 says. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures. Guys, serving divers lusts and pleasures. That is exactly your phone right there. You know why? Because within your phone, there's many lusts that are just pulling you in. I saw a picture of this guy. He drew a picture of a person looking at a screen. And everything around him is going. His wife is running around. His kids are trying to pull him. His work is calling him. Money is just flowing around. But the screen just has him tied up with chains just around his neck and pull them in and say, no, you got to listen to me. If you look at your screen time after the service, ask yourself a question. Am I facing those lusts? Look, we continue. It says, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Verse 4. Aren't you thankful for verse 4? But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. What a wonderful truth. I'll never forget. It was uh, January 10, 2010. I was 16 years old. Um, and God saved me. It wasn't something that I heard from a pulpit. Me and my cousins, we always sat in that corner next to the translation box. We were always on our phones. We, you, know, you wanted to stay away as far as possible from this pulpit and hear what's coming out of here. But we got in an argument. We started arguing about God. And we said, hey, I want to prove you something. But we know that the three of us, we're not really good with spiritual things. But we knew a guy in our youth. His name was Tim. Like, we, let's go find Tim. We're going to prove to one of my cousins, because he's very stubborn, we're going to prove him his point. So we take Tim. We go out to where we have the coffee stand. Back then, that wall didn't exist. We went in there. We sat. And we just said, hey, this guy, he's doubting the existence of God because through creation and all these things. And this brother just 
ignored what we asked, and he went straight to the gospel. He shared what God has been doing in his life. For the first time ever, I heard about a Holy Spirit and that a Holy Spirit wants to indwell in my life. But first, I have to accept Jesus Christ by faith. I have to repent of my sins and confess and come to him. And so it was a moment we all got up, the three of us, and we said, hey, I want to go make a decision for Christ. And my other cousin said the same. My third cousin was quiet. But we all stood up and we all walked in, went down the stairs, went around here, and we're standing right there by the elevator. And I look, the one cousin that was stubborn, that we wanted to prove our point to, he continued walking out the door. I thought he was following us, but he left. At that moment, a lot of things was going through my mind. But I know I can't save him. But I know that I needed to be saved. And so me and my cousin came up, and right in that corner, we kneeled down. We said, God, we can't do this. We're living a double life. I went through Sunday school. And every Sunday I've been showing up to this church. And at any given point that if I would have gave my last breath, I would have ended up in a fiery hell. God, I need you. God, I want you to come into my life and change me and give me your Holy Spirit. And I want to rely on the Holy Spirit. That your Holy Spirit is going to guide me. Because the next day I was in a public school. And that was the moment when I realized that God gave me a regeneration in my life. Because when I came, I had a broken heart for the people. I had a broken heart for the people that I was just hanging out with, going to parties and doing all these things. Now I want to come back and tell them what God did with me. A hypocrite, a two-faced Christian who came to Sunday, who also argued in public school that God does exist, but I lived a double standard life. I lived an ungodly life. And I'm glad God saved me. And praise God for that. We talked about and seeing what ungodliness does. But look what happens in our life. Grace, it doesn't just save us. It begins to teach us something. When we look at our text in chapter 2 of Titus, in verse 12, it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. So we talked about that, how we should deny those things. But look what he calls us to live for. A lot of times, a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, and hear me out. Why do we see a lot of people repent at conferences, come out and repent, and constantly come back and repent? They're facing the same sins. They're facing the same trials in their life, and they keep falling into it. And that's what Satan catches them in. Because a lot of times, they deny themselves. They come up and repent, but they never get up and take up the cross. They never get up and take this cross with them. And that means if you got to come back after you repent to your house, to your room, and break that screen, you break it. If it matters for you to delete all your social media accounts just to get closer to a holy God who is eternal, who died for you, who gave his life, it will be worth it. Because he gave his entire life so that you could live in eternity. And I'll tell you, it's worth it to break that screen. It's worth it to delete all your accounts. Because if that's pulling you away from God, don't think that repentance is going to give you strength. It's going to give you strength at that moment to come and delete it. But if you don't do that, it will be difficult. And that's why he says, and I'll go over these things. First point he says, to live soberly. To live soberly. It means to live with a sound mind. It means having a clear, disciplined mind. It means practicing self-control. Practicing moderation. It means constantly, every day, renewing your mind with the word of God. Because sometimes, we as humans, we face emotional stress. We face a lot of anxiety in our life. The word of God is there to give us spiritual stability in our mind. It symbolizes vigilance and spiritual clarity. And let me tell you this. Sober-minded goes beyond from just abstaining from alcohol and drugs. And I just pointed some things out. It's abstaining from social media. Guys, if you right now open your Instagram 
and just go on your search, you could see all the things that your interest of search is. And that's your heart. That's your heart. And if you go through those several 16 photos that are there before you scroll down, you'll see what you're interested in. And, and technology right now with AI and everything going in, your phone is going to show more of what you're watching and what you're giving attention to. I heard a story about a guy preparing for baptism classes. And he's, you know, learning these Bible verses. And one of his leaders just said, hey, can I see your Instagram? Went on his Instagram, clicked the search box, and just photos of nudity. Not fully nudity because they will be blocking it, but fully of nudity. Girls at the beach, uh, cars and girls with cars. And this guy's thinking about taking baptism. What's going to happen after baptism? You know what's going to happen? He's going to continue living that life. He's going to be hidden with his life of sin. And maybe, maybe if he realizes that he needs a God that can just clear everything out, he'll repent. Or maybe he goes in and gets married. And some of those things will be coming out. Issues of life. Protect your heart, Proverbs says, because out of it are the issues of life. Dear youth, I'm here telling you that the world that we live in today, it's a world of struggle for all of us, and we all live in it. I'm not any different. You're not any different. You're not any different. We all live in this world, and the temptations have been risen. What are we going to face tomorrow? Maybe all of us have so much focus right now on Kamala Harris or Trump and all of this. Did you ever think about it? I just heard a clip. This pastor is sharing a word. He said one thing. Revivals never happened when times were good. Church revivals never happened when times were good. Revivals with the people of Israel never happened with times of good. What if God would allow that president to get up there this week that we don't want What are you going to do? Are you going to be back on your phone? What, what, what if it comes to the point where they're going to take away your freedom of speech? Did you see that video two weeks ago when those two young men in their own campus who just said, Jesus is Lord. And they said, you're at the wrong rally. That came out real quick out of her mouth. This is what we face, youth. Let's open our eyes. Let's not waste our time. Let's get soberly. Let's live a righteous life for God. We talked about living soberly. We heard about living godly. That is to deny ungodliness. Living righteously, I want us to turn to a story. In Luke chapter 7, verse 40. Luke chapter 7. Verse 40. This is a story that as Jesus came into Simon's house, there's a woman there. And if you read about the story about this woman, she was not a clean woman. She was very unclean. She was living in sin. Verse 40, it says these words. And Jesus answering unto Simon, after he said, if you look at 39, it says, for she is a sinner, because she was touching Jesus. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have something to say unto you. And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged, Simon. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she have washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, 
But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased, has not stopped to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she have loved, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. This story rises up after Simon, who allowed Jesus to come to his house. With their culture of days, Simon, as the owner of the house, was supposed to prepare water for the visitor so that this guest, Jesus, can wash his feet. That was a practice at that time because a lot of people walk with open feet, sandals. They get their feet dirty. And he, as he comes in, he doesn't do that. But this woman did it. To live a righteous life, it means to live uprightly and do what is right. That means that desire comes out to do right, produces after your salvation. After you receive Christ, you are now on the vine and you are producing fruit. And that's Christ through you. Now, lastly, before we finish this page and we'll be finishing for tonight, we'll be continuing uh, the next three next week. In 2 Timothy, it says that there will be some that will have a form of godliness, but denying the power of it. As I was looking through this, there's many uh, stories of where people decided to follow Christ and their life, their manner of life just made the gospel of Christ into shame. But I came to this story, to a story where Jesus still lived. It's in John chapter 18. John chapter 18. If you open up there, we're going to read verses 2. Uh, we'll read from verse 1, 2, and 3. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Sudron, where was a garden into which he entered and his dis disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oftentimes resorted there with his disciples. Then Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, comes with lanterns and torches and weapons. I want us to focus on these three words in verse two. It says, knew the place. Jesus has a time when he took his disciples to many places. But he had a time where he really wanted to get the word out to them, and he was alone with them. Sometimes he was alone with just three. Sometimes he was alone with just one. But there, this was a place where he was together with all his disciples in this garden. And this is a place that Judas knew. It says he knew the place. And it's interesting that Judas was giving before his hands, without paying anything. He was going to get money for his reward. And he was given, in verse 3 it says, chief priests uh, gave him band of men and officers. And they came with torches and lanterns and weapons. I could just picture this picture with me. Judas carrying a torch or a lantern just to guide his way to Christ. He walks up to Christ and then he points. You can carry the light so close to you, but then reject Christ. You can be so close to knowing all the places that God has taken you in life. He's taken you from Sunday school to teens, and there's a moment where you had to repent, and there's a moment that you got baptized. You know all those places that God has taken you. But your life right now, what it shows, you're denying God. You say you're a Christian. You say you're holding the torch in your hand, but you're denying God. You're having a form of godliness 
but denying it and its power. So a lot of times when we want to say that we want to be a true Christian, we want to preach to this world and show who we really are, and we want people to get saved, we need to have a godly life. And God can only cleanse us. And it's okay if you're a church member. It's okay if you need to repent of something and say, God, I'm not as godly as you want me to be. I'm not as holy as you tell me to be. But God, I know that you're a God of second chances. It says a righteous man will fall how many times, youth? Seven times. And what would he do? Get right back up. So we serve a God, a merciful God. But this God is saying, I cleansed you. I gave my son and his blood is power enough. It has enough power to cleanse you. But now this grace, this free gift that is given to you, it's going to teach you something. You got to live soberly, you got to live godly, and you got to live righteously. I think you, you guys heard a lot today. But if I could just leave one thing, and that thing is this that if God today, would individually send every single one of us to the streets of where we live. Because being a witness for God is not a sports group. It's something that God calls individually. We don't go holding hands doing it. So if every single one of us gets sent to the streets and we have to tell one person about God, and let's say that person knows everything about your life, would there be something that they know about your life that will hinder the gospel? Will there be something that's in your phone that's hindering the gospel?